Those two mountains behind me represent one of the most significant barriers in the world in June of 1864. During the American Civil War, Kennesaw Mountain and Little Kennesaw were the last bastions protecting the city of Atlanta from the Yankee troops. If those mountains fell, so would Atlanta and the Southern cause would be lost. Well, those mountains eventually did fall. Thousands of men died assaulting and defending those heights. And when they fell, Atlanta was then burned a few months later. In the same way, there is a significant barrier protecting Neo-Darwinism that has recently fallen. Most people don't realize this, so I want to explain it to you. When people say Neo-Darwinism, they're not talking about Darwin. It's 50 or so years after Darwin, scientists brought together the idea of mutations, the new field, the rediscovered field of genetics that they had been ignoring for 50 years, and they put this all together with mutation theory into this idea that, ah, genes drive genetics, genes drive inheritance, genes drive evolution. Not the environment, but genes. Now, it's going to be 50 years more before we discover DNA. Watson and Crick, famously, Hershey Chase experiment. I discussed these things in earlier uh, episodes of biblical genetics. But this whole big ball of wax called the Neo-Darwinian synthesis is resting upon some very fundamental assumptions that have recently been questioned in the scientific literature. Now, those two big assumptions, one of those is called the central dogma of molecular biology. It's the idea that information goes from DNA to RNA to protein and not back again. Therefore, the inheritance of DNA is the thing that evolution depends upon. There's a one-way transfer of information from DNA to protein, and that's it. The second big assumption is called the Weissman barrier, named after August Weissman, a very, very important, very famous German scientist in the late 1800s, and he first realized that there's a difference between the somatic body cells and the reproductive cells. And the reproductive cells have a different path than the body, and the body is not inherited, only the reproductive cells are inherited. Now, very, very interestingly, Charles Darwin himself was not a neo-Darwinist. Oh no, he was Lamarckian. He believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics. He thought that there were little corpuscles that would bud off from all the different parts of the body, and they would be passed to the gonads, and therefore inherited. Or the examples that he used, he said, oh, jewelers are very often nearsighted because they're looking at their jewelry so intently over years and years and years. And because sightedness is highly heritable, therefore the jeweler squinting at something close by is going to have a child who is nearsighted. Or the counterexample, sailors. They're on their ships, they're looking at the horizon all the time. They're seeing these distant vistas. Sailors tend to be farsighted, like me. And therefore, because sightedness is so inheritable, obviously sailors would pass on the exercise of their eyes to their children. Now, that's not true, but Darwin went to his grave believing such things. August Wiseman was a contemporary of Charles Darwin. He died in 1914, born in 1834. He's a professor at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Very important early Darwinist, very important early scientist. He gave us the idea that there's a separation between the germ cells and the body cells, that is the reproductive cells and the somatic cells. So the things that happen to your body don't affect your children. Only the cells and only the information contained in those protected reproductive cells are passed on. There's a barrier there, but that barrier is no longer true. So the fall of a significant barrier can change history. The fall of Kennesaw Mountain changed American and world history. The fall of the Weissman barrier will change scientific history. The whole idea that there's this impenetrable barrier between the germ cells and the body cells is no longer true. Let's take some time to talk about human reproduction because this is fascinating. When you're developing as an embryo, your little reproductive cells weren't inside you. They were hanging out outside. And after the embryo develops into a certain level, the reproductive cells or the cells that will become the reproductive cells they form a conga line. They march across the outside of the embryo, they penetrate the embryo, and they invade the gonads. And at this point, sexual differentiation between male and female will start to happen. 
hormonal impacts at different stages of development, the secondary uh, sexual characteristics will start to develop at that point. There's always a genetic difference between male and female, but this is when the physical differences start. Those little reproductive cells have not been dividing like crazy like the rest of the body cells. In fact, from woman to a finished egg is only 20 cell divisions. So 20 cell divisions from fertilization to ovulation maybe 45 years later. So if you think about it, if there's only 20 cell divisions from one generation to the next in the female line, from Eve to modern people, I don't know, 6,000 years divided by 30, about 200 generations, 200 times 20 has only been about 4,000 cellular divisions in the female line between Eve and all modern people. That's why we're still alive. That's why genetic entropy and mutation hasn't destroyed us because the germ cells are separated and protected over long periods of time. That's not true in the males, however. There's about 30 cell divisions in the male and then at puberty, uh, those things will start to divide about 23 times a year. And then there's five more chromosomal duplications before the sperm are fully mature. So we're talking about from Adam to today's people, maybe 100,000 uh, uh, chromosomal duplications. And every chromosomal duplication is a possibility of more mutations being added because the little things that copy the DNA aren't perfect. So the Weissman barrier is critically important, but we can also see that there should be an erosion of the information content over time because of cellular division. But God orchestrated this so that we don't reproduce from skin cells. Uh, my skin cells here, I'm 52 years old. These things have gone through so many chromosomal duplications that I have basically every possible mutation imaginable in my skin. It's a good thing we don't reproduce from skin cells. Our other cells are protected. There are several ways in which the Weissman barrier is known to have been breached. We just learned about these things recently. The first way, and this is profound, as sperm are developing in the epididymis, they actively absorb RNA from the body. And what does RNA do in the cell? It controls production of protein. We also have RNA interference where if you have two different RNAs, one that's floating in the cytoplasm, one being manufactured from the DNA, they'll compete with each other for attention. We also have RNA interference in like the RNA can bind to another RNA or even bind to the DNA, prevent a gene from being produced. So RNA in the cell has a profound influence on the phenotype, the action and the look, the behavior of an organism, the phenotype. This is a design mechanism, the active absorption of RNA by the sperm is a design mechanism to affect change later on. Another way that we know the barrier has been breached is that we now understand that RNA is actively converted into DNA in the cell. During the HIV epidemic in the 80s, this is the first time the public became aware of something called reverse transcriptase, which takes the RNA from the virus, converts it into DNA, and HIV can stick its genome into human genomes. Therefore, that virus actively changes the genome. That's reverse, it's not supposed to happen, that's breaching the barrier. Other viruses are also known to do this. In our cells are multiple little machines called polymerases. Polymerases are in charge of copying DNA into DNA during DNA synthesis or DNA to RNA during transcription. But there's a previously unrecognized polymerase called Pol Theta. And Pol Theta does something no one anticipated. It actually takes RNA, converts it into DNA, and places that in the genome. It's involved in DNA repair systems. So if, a, if an error occurs in the DNA, it can use a backup copy of the DNA, the RNA, take that as a template and copy that into DNA. This has profound implications. Imagine that this is sort of like a computer program that you have loaded into memory. Maybe you're playing a game. So you take it, the program that's on disk, you load it into memory, you start playing the game, and all of a sudden the disk crashes. But the program's still in memory. Can you take the program and write it back to disk and restore the program? Well, of course not, because you've changed things while you're playing the game. And the computer has no way of knowing what happened before that. All it knows is here's the status now. If you save that to disk, you'd never be able to play the beginning part of the game again. It has changed. It's the same thing with Paul Theta. If it's taking RNA and using that to fix the genome, well, what RNA is it using? What if it's taking an RNA produced by the mother's copy of the genome, because you have two copies of the genome in each cell. What if it's taking the copy of a gene from the mother and using that to fix a copy from the father? 
Well, the mother and the father might have different letters in that place. What if it's taking a gene from a different place in the genome, maybe a, a similar gene with a similar sequence saying, oh, this fits, and it uses that to copy it over and fix? Well, that would be taking DNA from one place into RNA and then back to DNA again. This is not the Weissman barrier, everything's messed up. What if you have mixed race ancestry? What if your Y chromosome comes from an African sort of Y chromosome, but everyone else in your family tree is European? This has happened in England. I talked about this in maybe the first, second, or third biblical genetics episode. There is a Y chromosome circulating in a very old family in England that has characteristics of African. And yet this family knows nothing about African ancestry. Maybe this Y chromosome came from the Roman times because they had an African legion in, in England at that time. Whoa, this is very strange. But my point is this. If that African Y chromosome is surrounded by European genetics, any repairing on that African Y chromosome is going to be done according to the European standard. In the same way, if you had a maybe a European mitochondria in an otherwise African genetic background, well, there's pseudo copies of those chromosomal, those mitochondrial chromosomal genes in the genome. What if DNA repair is happening in the mitochondria that matches the African letters, not the European letters? Well, that means that you can't look at a mitochondria and say, oh, it has these letters, therefore it has that ancestry. It also means that mutations in the chromosomes aren't necessarily developing in a linear manner because you can get mutations copied from one place to the other, which means that you can't actually put a clock on the time of differentiation of any new branch in the family tree. You don't know how long ago these things happened. Now, I just skimmed over the surface there. If you want more information, go to creation.com and look up my article, The Barrier Has Been Breached. Just type in Carter Barrier or Carter Barrier Breach on creation.com and it will come right up. The fall of the Weissman Barrier is a significantly big deal. It is challenging the very assumptions behind neo-Darwinian theory. We can no longer assume what they assumed 120, 130 years ago is true because it's not. We know too much. Life is too complicated. Life is messy. Life is very difficult to explain in the simplifying models that neo-Darwinian theory is based upon are simply not true. And I need to give a big shout out to my supporters on buymeacoffee.com this month. Rob from Smithfield, brand new supporter. Craig C, brand new supporter. Pazu Kukukso, I hope I pronounced your name right. Thank you, sir. But also Stephanie S, multiple times this month, at RS2, John H, George B, and one anonymous donor this month. Thank you so much. But over on patreon.com, starting at my top level, Dave H, M Matsky, Rob S, you guys are awesome. My second level, you guys are also awesome. Mark K, Mike from Australia, Daniel P, James R, and Jeff VD. And at the lower level, not to be forgotten on Patreon, Jonathan P, Paul P, Ted H, and a brand new supporter this month, Chris R. Thank you.